What's up guys, thank you for clicking on the video. Welcome to Night Drive TV. So today I'm shooting a video. I've been away for a little bit, I apologize. I've been in the midst of a big move. If you're one of my subscribers that have actually followed some of my Pathfinder or Forerunner videos, I do have some updates coming on the Overland side of things, but today this video is gonna be about the Corvette Z06. I actually was prompted kind of to do this video by a video that just came out September 23rd from Savage Geese. Corvette C5, let's do it. And they did a review that the C5 Z06 was the best sports car you could get for under $20,000. They kind of questioned it. They went into a full on review and they gave their opinion as to why they thought it was. Now, I really like any video that supports the C5 Z06. I love the car personally, but I did have a few problems and critiques of the video that I want to correct here today. So if you're interested in this platform, if you may consider buying a C5 Z06 or even a C6 Corvette, which my girlfriend owns, I'm going to be doing a lot of reviews on the comparisons of the two modifications I've had on this one and updates on the carbon fiber pieces uh, that I am making for this car that go in this region right here. Um, it's kind of the hint on this video. So throw me a subscribe and let's get on with the video. So in the Savage Geese video, they began with the interior and it really stemmed around what they felt was just a hideous part of this car that they could not even potentially even purchase it. All joking aside, this is one of the worst parts about this car. I bet you it's bad enough it would stop you from buying this car. So the question is, were they accurate? Is the interior in this car as bad as everyone says? And I'm going to tell you my opinion. You know, I've had a lot of different vehicles and I've spent a lot of time in a lot of different types of cars, everything from Hondas to BMWs to Lamborghinis to Mercedes. I've had a lot of Corvettes. But that being said, I think that the interior is minimalist, but it is adequate. Uh, it doesn't have an abundance of features, uh, in-dash GPSs, heated seats, air conditioned seats, uh, thick sound deadening. In fact, the Z06 doesn't have sound deadening at all. Uh, I think the gauge package is functional. I think it's very analog and basic, and, and it's just what I would want in this type of car. I really, in terms of the driver information center, have no qualms about it at all, and Savage Geese's video didn't uh, disagree with that. Uh, what they did speak to was a lot of creaks and squeaks and things that do result from the fact that there are plastic materials used. I think the problem I had with that video is it implied that you hear these creaks and squeaks uh, going down the road, and that's not the case at all. They were pushing down and obviously putting some force into these surfaces. And the fact of the matter is, is going down the road, this car is pretty solid. And the fact that some people aren't recognizing is the byproduct of having a very basic interior is low mass. And the light weight of this car is the result of that. So there is no more effective way to make a car fast than to reduce mass. And that is something that has always been important uh, to the Corvette team. Essentially though, I think when you're looking at a car that was designed in 1995, essentially this iteration was probably penciled sometime in 1998. Uh, you know, th there's a different set of parameters that you kind of have to go by when you're discussing whether or not you should buy a C5 Z06. And so let's talk a little bit about that. So basically, you're going to have these three tiers. You're going to have your street driver, your dedicated, basically weekend driver, guy who's just going to take the car out, kind of wants a toy. Then you're going to have some people that are going to be a little bit more drag racing, straight line racing, dedicated. And that I kind of consider to be another tier. Someone who knows they're going to add a lot of power, who really has a focused cause for this car. And then lastly, you have people that are into HPDEs, autocross, things like that. Uh, of course, you're going to look at creature comforts and things. If, if your primary use is just a weekend toy, especially if you're, I mean, if your goal and your idea is to impress your friends or uh, you have the type of friends that need to be impressed or that you need to apologize to for your lack of uh, interior refinement, I mean, it's a strange group to me. It's not the group that I fall into. And so that's why I think the review missed uh, a tremendous amount of information. It looked at the cars, basically, here's what you get, here's the horsepower, here's the interior, here's the underside. It was a very cut and dry type of review, which I really just didn't connect with. You know, just to close up on the interior, I would encourage somebody to take a look at a late 90s Ferrari. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, a, in the 99 355, complete garbage interior. Uh, a 98 Diablo had a lot of time in that. I mean, it was like the center console and certain components, the, the door panels and things looked like they were made in a, 
in a shop in, in a garage you know granted they may have quality leather and beautiful stitching and whatnot but you know interior refinement really got pushed uh, heavily in the past I would say 10 or 15 years uh, prior to that of course the Germans and things had some really quality interiors and good quality components but let's be real I mean you're not buying this car uh, you know for infotainment and for heated seats I mean it's 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 at a price range that you know if somebody's gonna buy this car they want to go out and go fast so the key that I think you have to look at if you're looking at buying a C5 Z06 is you know the first category that's the guy that needs to watch the Savage Geese video but anybody in the second or third the drag racing the HPDE there's just a ton of reasons that this is the best car for the money so when you look at the 350Z FDR X7 E46 M3 you're looking at platforms that number one engine management is costly the parts are definitely much more limited because the LSX motor, I mean, it's across the entire GM platform. Cost of cam, springs, components, things like that are very affordable. Another critical issue you have to think about is weight. And that's really where this car truly excels. I had an S2000. I mean, that's a 2,850 pound car. This car as it sits, 2,980. So, you know, you can't beat low mass. When you look at a Hellcat, yes, it's 707 horsepower, but that's a 4,600 pound car. That in racing mass is everything and so that's a big reason that this car is just so potent and so hard to beat out of the box now let me tell you about a car i would consider if i were in the first category all right so let's say you're in the first category and you say you know what my friend's opinion of my interior is really important to me you know what i like my friends i want to impress them you know it's a tough debate when you're talking about twenty thousand dollars and you're talking about performance refinement something that comes close i really don't think anything's coming close in terms of drag strip or road course i mean reliability modification uh, quality and ability uh, i just don't think you're going to match it but e92 335i about eleven thousand dollars for the car definitely has a better interior a little bit more refined you know there are modifications uh, there's a dine and tune stage two i believe on those cars it's a twin turbo inline six. It's essentially a 2JZ swapped SC300, if you will. It's essentially, a, a, you know, a, a Supra ahead of its time, you know, if we're talking about the new Supra. Um, so, you know, and it really is a predecessor in a sense to the M4. Inline six twin turbo, lots of possibility in terms of horsepower. You can get that car, I think, for $20,000 invested, put some suspension on it, decent uh, stage two type of tune. Uh, on 90, 91, 93 octane, I think you could probably get that car in some realm uh, that's, that's similar to this to where you could be satisfied with it. And I think that's the way you have to go if interior fitment and, and, and you know, steering precision that like a German car can give you, I think that's where you need to go. And there is one thing, again, that they left out that I think is really important when it comes to the C5 Corvette, and that's the driver information center. You know, if you don't have a lot of resources available to you in terms of of uh, a scanner and things to do diagnostics you know it was a really a gift from gm that they put in the driver information center the ability to get the codes out of every single module and you can reset the codes this is something that not a lot of people talk about that i think is just such a critical uh it's a gift quite frankly they took it away from the c6 nobody really knows why but just hitting the option button and fuel four times it brings up all those menus. I mean, if you get a random O2 code, sometimes you'll get a, a few little random codes if you're on HP tuners, if you have an O2 elimination, something like that. You know, it's just, it's great to be out and about, not have the tools with you, jump into the driver information center and just shut it off. So look, let me, let me tell you what kind of really bugged me about the video. And it's why I just, you know, I see a trend that has really happened over the past 10, 15 years. Look, I was the guy reading magazines at eight years old. You know, I really have followed the automotive industry. I've been in the industry for all, pretty much all my life. And, you know, it's the evolution of the fact that the German and Japanese automakers in the 80s, 90s really fought for market share. But we have somehow come to a point now with the Internet that these European journalists and, and car reviewers, they're being revered as like the all-knowing. And, you know, in the Savage Geese video, I see him use the term Z, Z06. You know, that's a Z06. Keep in mind, Porsche put out a video to tell us how to say Porsche. 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 You know, it's not a Z06, it's a Z06. And I think we need the Corvette crew and the workers at the Bowling Green plant. Maybe they need to make a video for the Europeans to let them know that this is a Z06. So, you know, the Savage Geese video. It's a C5 Z06. Where he said Z06 and... 
kind of knocked on a few things, which I want to talk about now if you're still with me. First, let's talk about the balsa wood floor. Which is made of plastic composites with a balsa core. Wow. <laughs> Premium. Is, is that wood? Oh my God, really? You're yes. kidding. No. How, how many people got displaced? How many forests did they burn down to get that? All of them. It's the general. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the entire car has been mined from the planet. You realize that, right? You know, it's a really interesting feature in this car to where they essentially made a composite floor, much like you'll see in aircraft to where they take uh, uh, two basic uh, pieces of material, thin pieces of material like a carbon fiber and honeycomb sandwich them and make a, a composite and a very uh, structural core. And, you know, instead of me explaining it, let me show you what Tad Jucter had to say. Most cars use a single sheet of steel for their floor pans that can vibrate and shake. Our solution was to look at a composite floor pan. What we have is two sheets of SMC or fiberglass uh, sandwiched with a core of balsa wood. The balsa wood was extremely light, relatively low cost, had good vibration properties, and was very, very stiff. You know, aside from the fact he talked about burning down forests and how many displaced homes, I mean, Come on, man. Another thing Savage Geese talked about that, you know, it kind of got to me a little bit because I hear it repeated pretty frequently and there's a lot of misunderstanding as to why this car was designed this way, but it's the transverse composite leaf spring. Yeah, these are these are nice. It's got leaf springs in the front and the rear. I know. They it's... couldn't fit a coil spring in the front? GM doesn't understand that. It's not in GM's language. You know, he acted like this antiquated old technology, you know, why are we not replacing it with the ever so modern uh, coil spring? Because that's just, that's just so forward thinking. You know, there was actually a lot of things and thought put into why they actually use the transverse spring in these cars for quite some time. And it really has to do with the hood line and it has to do with keeping the car lean. This car features a composite leaf spring, as does the previous Corvette. You can see it attached down here to the lower control arm. Um, the benefit that a leaf spring, spring provides over a conventional coil spring is that it enables a lower hood height for better styling. And it also allows the shock to be pushed closer out towards the wheel to enable better wheel control and uh, damper performance. So, you know, another thing is, you know, if you're in the drift scene, which a lot of these are starting to show up and drift more, the C5s and C6s. <laughs> There's actually an angle kit available for these cars. You know, I look at the guys building 240s with LSX motors in them, iron block, a lot of front end weight, transmission right up front. You know, the fact that this car is as balanced as it is 50-50 uh, or pretty close to it, that a lot of people don't know that the transmission's in the back of these cars. It's actually kind of a like, transaxle configuration with a torque tube in the middle. Uh, but every body panel on bolts from this car, this is a, you can basically take the entire body off of this and still drive it as a drivable running car. You know, I'm big on body lines and I'm big on the view that the car kind of gives you from certain perspectives. I think everybody who's ever had a car just likes a certain perspective. And for me, it's kind of the side view with this car. I think the profile view, the FRC shape, I think it's super lean. I think it just looks light, looks nimble. And frankly, I just think it's what makes this particular Z06 unique. And I think it's what makes this Corvette unique. Uh, obviously you have a few things. I think you get a little bit of legacy design, a little bit of traditionalism with this car versus something more radical like we're seeing coming out now. I think this, this car really kind of positioned itself in a sense within GM in a really unique way because there were a lot of compromises when they built this car. You know, they really did have a budget restriction. They had to really push their minds and push themselves and how do we want to build this car to make it pure, to really make it you know, go back to the original RPO Z06 because this was the first time they had brought Z06 back since, you know, the 60s. And that car was developed under Zora Duntov as a race car. And so, you know, here they made some just really cool compromises. I've often called this the GT3 uh, kind of RS of the Corvettes in a sense because, you know, they did thinner glass, no sound deadening. First production car with a titanium exhaust from the factory, which I've modified. Check out another video that I have on that. Um, you know, and just, they, they really focused on reducing mass. And it's something when they went into the C6Z06, and especially the C7Z06, to where the demand for great interior and impressing your friends with your cup holders and, and air-conditioned seats, you know, these are the things that added mass, added weight, 
and granted they added horsepower but you know again the c7z06 i think was the culmination of just everything had gone too too far the car was 3600 pounds it overheated on track you know yeah you had you know your thick sound deadening in napa leather but you know the compromise at, at some point has to give and i think this car gives you a purity a rawness i think it gives you a connection to the road and that's what really plays into a lot of the modifications that I've done that I'm going to talk about in the next video. So look, the truth is, you know, Savage Geese, they've got a way more successful and much grander channel than I have. I think they have 200 and some thousand subs. You know, look, for me, it's just a hobby, but I've been in the business for a long time. I'm definitely an enthusiast of Corvettes. Um, you know, I've had quite a number of them. So, you know, the fact is, is if by chance one of you guys are watching, look, it was just a way for me to kind of nitpick your video a little bit and i certainly encourage any, anyone watching to go take a look at that video i'm not going to do a driving impression or anything like that i'm actually going to do that in the next video when i talk about the modifications so i want to thank you for watching i appreciate you giving me the time i hope you can throw me a thumbs up or a comment or a thumbs down if you wish i want you to know that i'm out here giving it my best shot and i hope you appreciate that so thank you very much for watching night drive tv and you have a good day